well, as Paula mentioned, my name is Suzanne, Suzanne Woods Fisher, and I am a author of books about the older Amish as well as other contemporary and some historical fiction. And this story I've, I've actually written um, and why I'm doing this presentation is a book called A Season on the Wind. And the heart of the book is the Christmas bird count, which is, which is such an interesting thing. And that's what we're gonna look at a little bit is how do the Amish, what do they have to do? I just have to figure out how, it seems like every time with my pointer, it changes depending on, on a, oh, I should practice with you. Every different Zoom, as I try to, to move forward the slide, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll get this figured out, do not worry. Okay, there, so I did it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience. So what do the Amish have to do with the, with the Christmas bird count, which is run by the Audubon Society? And I will get to that, but first I want to do a little bit of background on the CBC. Let's see if I can, there, okay, now I'm figuring it out. Okay, so um, this year marks the 122nd National Audubon Society's annual Christmas bird count, which I'll refer to as the CBC. And ironically, it wasn't always about counting live birds. Where? Oh. It was originally about um, something called the traditional Christmas side hunt. And as you can see in this painting, it's a painting of a pile of dead animals. This holiday tradition encouraged people, we're talking about the turn of the century in the late 1800s, 1900s, when people would go out in the woods on Christmas day and they would pick sides and the, they would then try to kill everything they could find that in fur or feathers across their path and the winner was the side with the largest pile of dead birds or animals. So that's the, the side hunt. And at that time, people really did not consider, um, they considered birds as just a limitless resource that it, unending. Then this is, this is kind of where conservation was at this point. It, it really wasn't in, in existence yet. And you can see from these, look at the feathers on these hats of these women, um, which is just amazing to think now we, we'd never find someone wearing something like that. But in 1900, hunters were supplying the fashion industry. They had nearly wiped out the snowy agri populations in America. And there was an estimated 5 million birds from 50 species were killed every single year in the name of fashion. So conservation was just at its beginning stages during this time. And many observers and scientists were just now starting to become concerned about declining bird populations. And that's when Frank Chapman stepped in. He was known for his, um, he, he ran, he was the editor of a magazine called Bird Lore. He was an American ornithologist. He was highly regarded. And he, he started the, he was also an officer in the, what was then kind of this, the, the beginning of the Audubon Society. This was in 1905, but he actually yes. began, um, began the idea of starting the Christmas bird count. I'm gonna find this on the bottom. Sorry, move forward. So he, um, he wanted it as an alternative to the traditional Christmas side hunt. And he invited his readers to begin a new holiday tradition of counting birds rather than killing them. And thanks to the enthusiasm of Frank Chapman, he ended up 27 people started and participated in 25 counts that year. They counted 90 species of birds and that began the first annual Christmas bird count. It's continued for 122 years. Just to give you a little picture of the, how things kind of changed in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was the, really the very first wildlife protection law that went into existence. And this was a statute that made it illegal to hunt or to take or capture or kill or even steal eggs or nests of birds that had been identified as um, possibly, you know, declining in populations. And, and it, it, you know, it's really played a role. I think the Audubon Society and the CBC played a role in America's growing conservation movement. And again, this Migratory Bird Act was for the birds of migration. So, whoops, sorry. 
Okay, so the purpose of the CBC is completely scientific. It is um, every year these thousands of Christmas bird counts take place across all of the US and Canada, Central and South America, the Caribbean, Pacific Islands. And its purpose is to assess the, the health of the bird populations and to help guide conservation plans for the future. So, uh, am I, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I'm having trouble with that. So every CBC has an established 15 mile diameter circular circular count area that they go into. And this is how it works. And on a prearranged date, register teams will go out with an assigned volunteer and they will, a volunteer observer, and the count, they will count the number of the birds of each species that they find within that assigned area. So each count has a volunteer compiler as well as the observer who sums up all the lists and they end up inputting the total number for each species into the Audubon bird, um, Audubon Christmas bird count database. And today, the CBC is the longest running citizen science project and wildlife survey in the world and is really considered the gold standard of citizen science. So to learn more, if you're at all interested in, in joining a CBC in your area or find one near you and, and you don't have to know anything about birds, you don't have to be a bird expert, you just need to have an interest and you want to learn, um, you, they welcome novices. And I have on my website, you can go and you can find a survey near you at suzannewoodsfisher.com slash count. So let's get back to the Amish. What do the Amish have to do with the Christmas bird count? Well, the Amish are really sharp, sharp birders. They're some of the sharpest birders in the country. And interestingly enough, an inordinate amount of rare birds are sighted by the Amish. And I'll get to the reasons for that in a minute. But first I wanna give you just like a, a quick little background about the old order Amish because there's so many misconceptions about them. They are an offshoot of the Mennonites. And that's a Protestant denomination that began in Europe in the 1500s led by a formerly Catholic priest named Menno Simons. So the Mennonites came from Menno Simons. And about this time in the early 1500s, Menno Simons and others, a small group believed in adult baptism rather than infant baptism, which at our day and age kind of sounds like, why would that be such a big deal? But in that time, that was a deal breaker. And these people, they were given the name Anabaptists they were heavily persecuted for their beliefs. They were chased across Europe and their belongings were confiscated and many were martyred. And the, that distrust of government is still a part of who they are. They have, um, and it's one of the reasons why the Old Order Amish in particular aren't connected to the public utility grid, why they have their own schools, why they live separately. But back to just this time of persecution, the Mennonites continued to grow and grow and grow despite you know, all the, the, uh, all the, the persecution they experienced and other groups started splintering off. And you might recognize some of these names, Hutterites and River Brethren and Apostolic and German Baptist, which was my, my own grandfather. Um, he also called Dunkards. So now let's fast forward over 200 year period. And we're now in the late 1600s. There was a Mennonite bishop named Jacob Amon, and he believed that the church was not making enough stands when it came to personal discipline. He introduced the concept of shunning, and that became the Amish church. So only the Amish will shun. No, none of these other Anabaptist groups have that as part of their church discipline. Today, there are no old, old order Amish in Europe at all. There are Mennonites all over the world, but not the Old Order Amish. They're in North America. But it might surprise you to learn that they are the fastest growing population in North America. They're not the, they're not the largest, not the biggest, but they are the fastest growing. Pennsylvania and Indiana and Ohio have the largest Amish populations in the US. And I'm actually going to now zero in a little closer to Ohio, to a little county named, not so little, Holmes County, which is in red on the, the screen. 
So in Holmes County, there have just been a large amount of rare bird sightings on Amish farms. Some bird populations that are declining in some parts of the country, like kestrels, are actually increasing in the vicinity of Amish farms. The Amish love birds and the birds love the Amish. This is something you'll see on almost every Amish farm I've ever seen. It's Purple Mountain Martin houses. They are um, like mini airports, the way the birds are just coming in and going out and coming in and going out. And they are excellent mosquito eaters, which is the reason they're on the, the you know, with the farm. Here's some pictures, and these are pictures I took myself. This is an Amish schoolhouse. I was able to spend the day in the schoolhouse. I've done that in a couple different schoolhouses, and it's, it's such a privilege to be in a one-room schoolhouse and sit in the back quietly and just watch and listen. But you can see here what the teacher had done. It was a male teacher, by the way, and he has uh, rigged up the bird feeder right by the window so they can add food, they can watch the birds all through the day. Um, Here's a picture of corn shocking in Holmes County. The Amish will shock their corn stalks in the field to overwinter, and it provides excellent places for birds to find food and to rest through the winter. But why does why are there an inordinate amount of rare bird sightings on Amish farms? And there's a couple of reasons for that. Now, Primarily, the, uh, the work of the Amish keep them outdoors as farmers, and they're very attuned to nature. And here's one of the reasons, a horse and a buggy is their chief means of local transportation and traveling country roads at a much slower pace than the rest of, rest of any of us, just allows them to see and hear things that those of us driving in cars would miss. That's me in the right-hand side, by the way. Um, if you ever get a chance to ride in an Amish buggy, I encourage you to do so because it is not to be missed. It's such a totally different feeling to ride on a road when it is slow and you see things and you're listening. And then if a truck rumbles by, it's ter terrifying, just absolutely terrifying. But another reason that there are more birds on Amish farms and more rare bird sightings the traditional farming methods haven't really changed from the Amish, not as radically as practices on commercial farms. There are very few pesticides or herbicides are used and without the insecticides, their fields have of course more insects, which attracts more birds. There's another couple of pictures of corn shocking. It's kind of considered a lost art, but it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful sight in winter to see. So many Amish beginning at a really early age enjoy birding. It's you know studying it and observing it and recording, recording bird sightings. It's a hobby that's embraced by the Amish culture. Families will do it. They all participate and enjoy it. Birding also creates jobs for the Amish. They build birdhouses and bird feeders that are sold at roadside stands and local cottage industries and even in some of the larger retail stores in the area. They sell bird seed, binoculars, scopes, accessories. But why, what is it about Holmes County in particular that's so appealing to rare birds? Well, in the Holmes County Amish, I should say, oops, sorry. Um, you know, they feed birds, they watch birds, they record what they see. And all those trained eyes and ears that are alert during daily activities, they will hear unusual bird calls or they will see a bird that, that isn't common in the area and it doesn't go unnoticed. You know, rare bird finders tend to find rare birds. Here's an example. This is a northern weed ear. And they, um, this little bird had been blown off course in a storm as it was making its way from the Arctic. It's amazing. It fly, it's really small and it will fly all the way from where it summers in the Arctic, all the way to the tip of Africa where it winters. There was an Amishman named Emery Yoder that was just out one on his farm and he, I don't know if he saw it or knew it, knew or would just experienced enough that he realized he had an exceptional bird sitting on his wood pile. So word soon spread over the rare bird alert. That's usually how the Amish will connect with others on the rare bird alert. Um, and over the next couple of days, hundreds of people, Amish and non-Amish, 
came to see this little bird. And not all Amish farmers are as gracious as Emery Yoder in letting people into their homes and, and you know, on their property. But he even had a guest book for people to sign. So the Amish are just considered some of the sharpest birders in the state of Ohio, but they're really quick to point out that it's not just their keen awareness of birds. Holmes County is also um, has a rich habitat in the area, dense woodlots and bushy fence rows and croplands and streams and ponds and all the things that the birds love. And of course, Ohio is one of the four flyways that cross almost like air, uh, freeways in the sky for birds during migration period. And Ohio is right over the Mississippi um, flyway. So they, they get a lot of the migratory birds as well. So it, one thing the Amish have started to do is create birder clubs. And these are, it's kind of fun because they're not people that generally join things. And yet they, um, it's a popular pastime that has started in Ohio and many young and adult Amish birders have been involved in participating in these birder clubs. It's kind of a fun way for young people to spend time learning about birds. And that brings me back to the popularity of the Christmas bird count among the Amish. My friend Cheryl Harner was president of the Ohio Audubon Society, and she would add to this that the CBC is only a male thing among the Amish. You would not find women and girls going on a CBC. Um, they will, families will participate in birding, but they would not go off on, alone on something like this, not like the men and the boys do. And then one thing I love about teenage boys in Ohio is that Ohio allows bicycles for the Amish. Uh, Lancaster County, for example, only has scooters, but in, in Ohio, you see people zooming around bicycles everywhere and teenage boys will only bird from their, their bicycles. They'll even turn, um, turn away a car ride if they're offered it or a van. They just, they just circle around their 15 mile radius in the brick in their bikes. So before we go to a time of question, I wanted to just add a little funny story from my own backyard birding experience. And this happened just a couple of months ago. So in April, we have a, um, some redwood trees in our backyard. And I noticed a Western screech owl was there and she'd come back for the second year. I'm assuming it was her for a second time. Um, might not be, but it, it's neat to see the owls in the backyard. And I love listening to them in the night. Well, about a week or so after I noticed she was here, I went out one morning and there was this little gray, almost softball sized fluff, ball of fluff by my back door, right by the door. I've been feeding the dogs and going in and out. And at first I actually, I have to be honest, I thought it was a rat, but, but then I looked closer and I realized it's a baby owl. So for most of the day, I mean, it, it had hopped all the way from the redwood tree around the house to the back door. I don't know how it could have done that or why it would have done that, but it ended up right at our back, you know, with sliding door, about a hundred feet. I think it was maybe about 50, well, maybe 75 feet. But anyway, for most of the day, I just hoped the mother would return or come for it. And I, I just kept the dogs away from the door. I kept my little grandchildren away from the door. And I hoped maybe it might hop back. But as the day went on, I realized it wasn't happening. So finally, I called our, our local wildlife museum and they told me what to do. So we called my son-in-law, James, who was a college pitcher in baseball and his long arms. And he came right over and he scooped the baby owl into a container. This is his little, my little granddaughter, Annie, his little daughter, looking in at the container at this little baby owl. And um, my husband, in the meantime, had set up this huge ladder so that James could climb up because he wasn't afraid of heights. And he, James returned the owl to the box really carefully. He said that when he, you know, dipped the container into the owl box, he heard some like clattering sounds inside. You can almost imagine like the mother owl um, looking at him like, where have you been all day? But anyway, the, the Wildlife Museum said to just watch carefully and make sure that the baby was not being rejected from the owl box, because if so, I needed to get it right over to the museum for their wildlife hospital. So I did, I watched carefully and everything seemed to be fine and going well. 
And then um, about a week after that, we woke up to the sound of a crash against our house, followed by some flapping sounds. It was like six in the morning. And there was this baby owl out on a test flight. Now look at how what has happened in just the course of a week, how it has feathered out from that little ball of fluff to it's almost double the size. It's look at all those feathers on its wings. I'm not sure it's the best flyer, but he hung on the screen for a um, kind of probably about five or 10 minutes. I got some pictures of him and then he took off and we haven't seen any of the owls since. And you might be thinking this owl might not have been the brightest owls. I kind of like to think he was stopping by just to say thanks before he took off for a while. Anyway, that brings me to my, my book. This is called A Season of the Wind. And it's a story about an, another rare bird, a white-winged tern that ends up on a little Amish farm in Pennsylvania and he kind of turns the town upside down. There's an Amish teenager, Micah, Micah Weaver. And I love this character. He, um, he works as a field guide for avid bird enthusiasts. And Micah has, well, in between each chapter, Micah writes a bird log, unusual birds that he spotted in the area and a little bit of information about them, typical of what birders do. But it's one of the best reasons to read the book because what's fun about this Micah Weaver is that he has a speech impediment. So as a result, he really doesn't talk much, but he listens well. He listens very, very well. And that's actually the first lesson of birding is listening well. So if you'd like to find out more about Micah or about A Season on the Wind, you can check it out with your librarian. You can um, go to your favorite retailer, of course. And if you'd like to stay in touch with me, I have a free gift for you. If you want to go to SuzanneWoodsFisher.com slash gift, and you'll see what, what that's all about. But And with that, I am done with this part of the presentation, and I will stop sharing the screen and turn it back to Paula. If you have any questions, I'm, I can stick around for a little while and we can talk.